Sue Strawn, and I am honored to have the opportunity to serve as your moderator for this town hall forum on oil spill legal guidance. I think we're all very painfully aware of the tremendous impact that the BP oil spill has had all along the Gulf Coast. From those who make a living harvesting the seafood in the sea, to those who work in the tourism and also in the hospitality industry and all of the related industries, so much around it. Many of these families, thousands of them in fact, have suffered tremendous losses. They've lost income. They have seen their livelihoods threatened. We are aware that BP has established a now independently administered $20 billion fund to compensate people for those losses. But the questions become, who's eligible for that money? How much? How do you file a claim? What kind of documentation do you need? And what happens if your claim is denied? Some of these and many other questions will be answered by a distinguished panel of local attorneys. They have been assembled by the Pensacola Bay Area Chamber of Commerce. We're delighted to have with us Jeremy Branning with Clark Partington Hart, Larry Bond and Stackhouse, Raymond Palmer from the law office of Raymond Palmer, Jason Peterson from Clark Partington Hart, Larry Bond and Stackhouse, Jim McKenzie from McKenzie Hall and De La Pedra, and Matthew Vilmer from Emanuel Shepherd and Condon. Attorneys, thank you very much for being with us. We will first get an overview of the Oil Pollution Act. There are always uh, there are laws on the books. There are things that govern how processes are supposed to work. And we'll start with getting some explanation. Jeremy Branning. Uh, my name is Jeremy Branning. I practice general civil litigation with Clark Partington Hart since the Deepwater Horizon exploded uh, in April and the leak continues, we have all been bombarded, in including lawyers, with a volume of information about what our rights are, what our remedies are. Uh, I hope today that we can provide some, some good key points to provide some clarity to what can be an admittedly confusing morass of, of law and remedies that are available to businesses and to, to individuals, whether it be a, a private landowner or somebody who's been laid off from their job. There is a, a tremendous amount of information available to the public uh, on the internet. The Coast Guard has a tremendous amount of information on its website as well as uh, various other sources, news sources, and, and even BP has published a, a, a tremendous amount of information available to the public on the internet. We've all seen in the news, or heard in the news, about the, the claims process that British Petroleum has established to help provide some relief to businesses and individuals who have suffered uh, losses as a result of the oil leak. Why has BP set up a claims process? And the direct and frank answer is that BP was required to by federal law. That federal law is the Oil Pollution Act of 1990. Today I'm, I'm going to talk about two key points to the Oil Pollution Act. Recognizing that the Oil Pollution Act, and I'll abbreviate it as OPA going forward, uh, is a, a a tremendous federal law that covers a, a, a huge area. And I'm going to distill today uh, what I perceive to be two of the critical talking points uh, for purposes of this discussion. The first part is identifying the responsible party. And the responsible party is a defined term in the OPA. In addition to the identification of the responsible party, uh, I'm going to talk about the, the obligations the responsible party has once a spill or leak occurs. The, the second critical point that I'm going to talk about within the OPA is the establishment of the Oil Spill Liability Trust Fund. And that is a fund that is administered by the Coast Guard and it, it contains additional relief or additional venue for relief, rather, uh, in the event that a claim is unable to be resolved directly with the responsible party. The Oil Pollution Act was passed in 1990 
following uh, the Exxon Valdez spill in 1989. It was the federal response to recognizing that there was no law in place that provided a uniform uh, procedural approach to responding to an oil spill. In fact, the government following the Exxon Valdez spill found itself uh, reaching for various laws in order to bring relief to the state of Alaska, the landowners there, the individuals and the businesses uh, that had been so affected uh, as a result of the, the Valdez spill. The Oil Pollution Act was passed in 1990 and provided that the owner or operator of a ship or a facility that caused oil spills was liable for the damage resulting for those spills. It seems obvious that that would be a, a natural you know, law to pass, particularly given that this country is so dependent on, on petroleum products. Uh, but until the Exxon Valdez spill, uh, there, was, there was nothing really in place that provided the uniformity that the OPA attempted to structure. The responsible party under the OPA uh, is required to pay for all removal costs to clean up the oil spill and to minimize the damage caused by the oil spill. It's not as simple as first blush would suggest to identify who the responsible party is in an oil spill. Here, British Petroleum has acknowledged that it is the responsible party. There's no dispute. But in many oil spills, it's difficult to identify who the responsible party is. For example, we all know that South Florida has a very bustling and healthy maritime industry. If there are three or four cruise ships at dock, as well as a commercial cargo freighter, and someone is loading cargo onto the freighter and looks down into the water and sees oil, whose, whose oil is it and where is it coming from? At that point, an investigation would be initiated in response to the report of oil, and the, the appropriate responsible agencies would attempt to step in and identify uh, whose ship leaked the oil or where the oil is coming from. We also saw this shortly after the, the Deepwater Horizon when there was a report of oil sheen uh, in, in Perdido Bay. And there was no evidence that oil had already reached our area from the Deepwater Horizon. It was probably from a passing ship. And so the investigating agencies would look at what ships had passed through the particular area and attempt to identify where those ships are and then look at those vessels to see if any of them were, were leaking oil, particularly if, if they were carrying crude uh, as their cargo. So it's not, it's not always immediate who the responsible party is. And sometimes a responsible party is unable to be identified. In addition to identifying the responsible party, the, the OPA creates the Oil Spill Liability, Liability Trust Fund, excuse me. The, I'll refer to it as the fund going forward. The fund is, is funded with a five cents per barrel tax on imported and exported crude oil. The value of the fund uh, varies. Uh, it, it's our understanding that the fund is uh, currently in excess of $1 billion, which it was originally established to be at $1 billion. Uh, it's in place to pay for removal costs and to pay for costs that were not recovered or paid for by the responsible party in the claims process. In other words, it's the, the second tier of relief available to a claimant if you are unable to resolve your claim directly through the claims process that the responsible party has set up. I talked a little bit earlier about the, the, the duties and the responsibilities of the responsible party under the OPA. 
uh, I talked a little bit about the, the obligation of the, the responsible party to pay for all removal costs. The responsible party, in addition to paying for all removal costs, is also responsible uh, to pay for damages for injury to natural resources, real or personal property, loss of subsistence use of natural resources, loss of revenues, and that includes loss of revenues from state, federal, and local governments, uh, loss of prop profits, and the impairment of earning capacity, and the cost of providing additional public services. And this generally uh, is relief afforded to, to federal, state, and local agencies for their requirement and the costs they incur to provide additional public services, such as uh, additional uh, fire responses, additional medical personnel, uh, additional uh, police personnel uh, to respond to uh, affected areas. The objective of the OPA is to make the injured party whole. In other words, to put the parties that have been injured as a result of the oil spill in the position they would have been in had the spill not occurred. The, the OPA requires, and just to talk a little bit about the procedure, the OPA requires the responsible party to first make a claim, I'm sorry, re requires a claimant to first make a claim to the responsible party and then make a claim to the trust fund. You can, you can also uh, file a lawsuit in state court and the OPA does not preclude a claimant's ability to file a lawsuit in court. I'll conclude there and thank you again for your time and the opportunity to speak with you. All right, and we certainly will have an opportunity also for our, the members of our studio audience to post questions to our panelists after we conclude hearing their statements. To discuss more the claims process and the sources of funding, Raymond Palmer. I'm humbled to be here today sharing information with you. I am humbled by the task ahead. Jeremy alluded to a lot of informational websites that are out there. My office has, has printed out a form and on the table out front, you'll find those informational websites. In addition, I want to take a, a minute to plug the University of West Florida. The Uni University of West Florida has a Center for Environmental Diagnostics and Bioremediation. Anyone who has listened to some of the science of the spill that's coming out from this area knows that UWF has been providing very enlightening information. Jeremy spoke to uh, the claims process and responsible parties. At this point in time, British Petroleum has admitted being a responsible party. There are other parties out there. The designer of the backflow preventer, Cameron, they may be deemed a responsible party. It's a questionable whether Halliburton will be deemed a responsible party, but they have deep, park, deep pockets also. The first step for recovery under the Federal Oil Pollution Act is to submit your claim to the responsible party in compliance with the federal regulations. As, been, as has been widely published, claims may be submitted to British Petroleum online, in person at a claims office, or via telephone, and I'll give the number that's been published, 800-440-0858. The types of claims that British Petroleum has been paying for private claimants, for private claimants is property damage, net loss of profits and earning capacity, subsistence loss and natural resource damage, removal and cleanup cost. The Code of Federal, Regu Code of Federal Regulations, Regulations sets up a process for the documentation and BP's website can provide assistance with some of that documentation requirements. But there's some pitfalls. One of the pitfalls to have recovery under the Federal Oil Pollution Act, whether it's a lawsuit under OPA or whether it's trying to get money from the trust fund, 
is you must submit those claims to the responsible party. Currently, British Petroleum is not paying claims that have been determined to be remote or speculative. This is the catch. One of the claims that British Petroleum is not paying is diminution of property values. This type of injury could be one of the most substantial that our area suffers. So when the claim is filed, you should include those kinds of injuries. The claim that's submitted to the responsible party has to be in compliance with the Code of Federal Regulations. Under the current BP claims process, there are some differences. I will assume that's not intentional, but you have to understand, to get recovery, you have to submit a claim in compliance with the federal regulations. So if you're concerned that, you're, that the, the BP claim that you file is not in compliance, so that later on you can get money from the trust fund, or you can file an action under the federal OPA, you need to speak with competent counsel to make sure your claim is in compliance. Once you file the claim with the responsible party and you've been denied, you can sue the responsible party under the Federal Oil Pollution Act. Alternatively, a non-paid claim may be submitted to the Oil Spill Liability Trust Fund. The Code of Federal, Reg Federal Reg Regulations, Title 33, Part 136, details that procedure. Another pitfall, time requirements. You must file your claim for damages, which is a separate category, within three years after the date of injury. I'm going to call the Code of Federal Reg Regulations CFR because I'm stumbling over that word, but the CFR extends the date with the language that the injury, when it was reasonably discoverable with the exercise of due care. You must file your claim for removal cost within six years after the date of completion of all removal actions for the incident. So those are the time requirements. My suggestion to you is that you serve the responsible party sooner rather than later. Other areas of recovery are claims filed under Florida State statutory or common law. The Florida Statute Chapter 376 provides for liability of the responsible party under the Florida's Pollutant Discharge Prevention and Control Act. The legislative intent of Chapter 376 is laid out as follows. The legislature finds and declares that the highest and best use of the seacoast of the state is as a source of public and private recreation. The legislature further finds and declares that the preservation of this use is a matter of the highest urgency and priority, and that such use can only be served effectively by maintaining the coastal waters, estuaries, tidal flats, beaches, public lands adjoining the seacoast in as close to a pristine condition as possible. Let's hope that the Florida courts uphold that legislative intent. Some areas under common law theories would be negligence and trespass. I also wanted to share, as far as funding surface, uh, sources, some emergency loan availability. The United States SBA has loan disaster relief programs. The website floridaoilhelp.com and the Florida Small Business Development Center can help with the Emergency Bridge Loan Program and the SBA Loan Programs. Thank you. If you're hearing terminology, if, if just from the presentation of our first two attorneys, uh, you, you're feeling overwhelmed, don't worry, you're, you're, you're not alone. And as we work through this maze, that's why these attorneys have graciously agreed to come here today because it, it is overwhelming. It, there, there is a lot of legalese. This is a very complicated issue, but it is impacting um, very everyday John Q citizens. So how do we work through this maze? How do we protect ourselves and our families and our community? And we'll get some clear answers. Uh, we're gonna hear now about class action suits and multi-district litigation. Jason Peterson. 
here. My name is Jason Peterson. I'm with the law firm of Clark Partington Hart as well. You've heard about the claims process established by the Oil Pollution Act, but I'm sure you've all also heard about lawsuits that have been filed from Louisiana, Florida, I think in excess of over 100 now, some of which are related to the very unfortunate loss of life related to the spill. Uh, some of, uh, or the majority of them though, are related to proposed class action lawsuits for economic loss that certain business sectors have, uh, have experienced. Uh, and a class action lawsuit is a vehicle where a proposed plaintiff files a lawsuit on behalf of many. And they are alleging or telling the court that I am a person who has been harmed by an event as many other people have in my similar situation. And I would like to speak on behalf of all of these people and be designated the class representative. Uh, that doesn't happen automatically. The court must entertain a motion from that class representative and certify a class. Uh, the rules of federal procedure and state, of proce state procedure in Florida uh, require certain things before a class is certified. The first thing is, is the number of people affected. There must be a significant number of people to rent, to warrant a class certification. Uh, numerosity is the legal term. Ms. Strawn mentioned legal terms you may hear. Numerosity is the first element uh, that must be satisfied to certify a class. Uh, the second is commonality. That means that all the affected class members must have common uh, injury or common facts that led to the common injury. And the court considers that. And, and all of this, the, the umbrella of all of this is efficiency. The court is trying to consider whether grouping all these cases together is more efficient than having hundreds of lawsuits participating uh, individually in, in, in different areas. So commonality is the second element. Then you have typicality. And the typicality requirement is, is this class representative, is this person that's coming forward to, to represent the masses, is their claim typical of the, of the members? And the court considers that. And then the last is, is adequacy of representation. Is this class member adequate to represent uh, the class as a whole? Do they have adequate counsel? Is this person in the best position to represent the interests of all that may be affected? Uh, the court weighs that and considers that, and uh, that's done by motion. There has not been a class certified in any lawsuit yet. Uh, people are going to ask, and the court will entertain that. Uh, it is unknown uh, whether a class will be certified. Uh, commercial fishermen who actually go out and, and are di directly use the water and harvest the resources and use that resource for their economic gain, they may be in a position to get a class certified. Shrimpers, oystermen, maybe. Uh, hotels, I don't know. Restaurants, I don't know. Uh, I don't think anybody knows at this point. Uh, the lawsuits from Louisiana to Florida have been, uh, I know in Florida, have been stayed at this point uh, for because a motion has been filed in front of another judicial panel, which I'll talk about in a second, dealing with multi-district litigation. But if a class is certified in any court, uh, it is likely that the court will require notice be given to any class member. So if a class is certified and you, you individually or as a business would be considered a member of that class, you would be given notice of that class action certification and you would have the opportunity to consider do I want to be a part of that class or do I want to opt out of that class and, and proceed on my own. And the notice that you will be given will explain that procedure to you. And of course that's a critical thing that, that anybody uh, in that position would need to consider and you would want to seek legal counsel to determine which avenue is best for your situation. That's class action. I've also been asked to talk about multi-district litigation and that's a little different. Uh, multi-district litigation is a situation where there are lawsuits filed in many district courts in many states that involve the same or similar factual situation. Think of the Toyota case, sudden acceleration, 
several people, many people harmed in different states, but thinking and, uh, that it's from the same, same source, same action. Why is this car suddenly accelerating? What happened? What's the engineering? When did they know? What did they do to fix it? All of those, the answers to all those questions would need to be known by every person in every state that had one of those cases. Chinese drywall, you may have heard about that. A similar thing. Undoubtedly, this will be a multi-district litigation case because we've got cases in Louisiana to Florida. Everybody needs to know how this happened. Everybody needs to know why it happened. Everybody needs to know what those conversations were on that rig the, the, before this thing exploded. Everybody needs to know what Halliburton was saying to, uh, to the BP company men. We need to know that. And it's more efficient to get the answers to those questions if all of this discovery phase is consolidated into one federal district trial court for the purpose of getting these answers. And there is a motion pending right now before the Judicial Panel on Multi-Litigation. That, that is a panel comprised of seven federal court judges from different uh, federal court districts. They're appointed by the United States Supreme Court. And the motion has been filed and is pending before them. And, and, and BP has filed their own motion, so really it's uncontested. Uh, plaintiffs and defendants agree that this case needs to be moved to a district court for discovery purposes. Depositions, interrogatories, document review, everything you would expect that uh, lawyers and, and, and clients would, would want to get access to to find out how to prove their case. Uh, that motion is set to be heard in the end of July. I think July 27th, Boise, Idaho of all places, I think. Uh, and there will be a decision made by that panel as to whether A, the MDL will be created, and I think that's gonna happen, and B, if so, where is the MDL gonna be, and who is the judge gonna be? Uh, those are critical things. Uh, for, for obvious reasons, but Jim may know a little more about this, but my understanding is it's, it, you know, the battle, if there's a battle, New Orleans versus Houston. Uh, Houston is a place where there's business headquarters, there's documents are centrally located, maybe many witnesses will be there. Again, when the panel is considering where to have the MDL located, uh, efficiency is on their mind. They wanna know what the access is like to get to the location. Is it going to help to have it here for document review or depositions and the like? Uh, and then, of course, there, there will be a judge assigned, and one of the considerations there is, is the judge qualified to administer complex litigation, which this will be, and does the judge have the time? I mean, if you know from the court system here, judges are backed up. Judicial resources are not there. This case, because of the damages that are, are experienced by the people, needs some quick uh, and swift resolution. So hopefully that will be considered when, when the MDL is created. Um, the MDL is mainly for the purpose of coordinating the discovery. And then once that's completed, and that's done pursuant to a court order, the court order will set that out. And once that's completed, usually all the trials are then remanded back to their initially filed jurisdiction all the cases are remanded to conduct the trial. And the discovery will be, should be similar, will be similar in all of the cases. And then of course, each person or each business would have to prove their own damages. And uh, that's, that's the litigation aspect of it. There, there's some litigation limitations that you need to know about. We've talked about the OPA. The OPA is a federal law, not a state law, but the federal law of the OPA requires you to go through the claims process before you file a claim under the OPA. You have to do it. You can't file a lawsuit now alleging a violation or damages under the OPA if you haven't exhausted your remedy under the claims process. So, so that's, that's important to know. Now if you file your claim and it goes, it's not resolved or it goes unsettled for 90 days, that's the, that's the, the window, then you have a decision to make, and Mr. Palmer mentioned that. You can then file your lawsuit under the OPA, or you can 
proceed to the secondary source of funding, which is the trust fund. Uh, I, I really thank you for your time. Um, I hope I, it's been helpful and we'll have questions answered. And Mr. McKenzie, I think, is next. Well, we have heard a lot about that $20 billion uh, fund that has been set aside by BP that is now being independently administered. When you think about literally the thousands and thousands of families that are impacted across these several Gulf Coast states, is that essentially a, a drop in the bucket? BP is on record as saying that if the $20 billion isn't enough, whatever it takes uh, to make people and the region whole, uh, they will ante up that money. To talk more about that $20 billion fund specifically, Jim McKenzie. Thank you very much, Sue, and, and I appreciate very much the opportunity the Chamber has given us to come and talk with you, and I think uh, you all should thank the Chamber for setting this up in WSRE, for filming it at this time and making it available to people who couldn't be here today so that they can have maybe some of their questions answered. The, the interesting thing about this fund, the $20 billion fund, is that that's all we hear pretty much is the $20 billion fund. What we don't hear is that, for instance, that that $20 billion fund is not going to be deposited by BP tomorrow. It's not there yet. Uh, BP is not committed to put $20 billion in that fund this year. BP is committed to put $5 billion in this year, and then the next three years will uh, supposedly put in another $5 billion. But until it happens, BP has promised a lot of things that haven't happened. So you need to be aware of the fact that, that, that this fund uh, in that situation may be happening or may not be happening in total. Uh, we won't know until it's happened. For instance, I've been in meetings the last two weeks. I, in fact, I came from a meeting yesterday in New Orleans where we talked with uh, the partner of uh, Mr. Feinberg, who you've been hearing a lot of, but his partner is Mike Rosen. And uh, we, I've now had two opportunities to be in a question and answer session with lawyers and Mr. Rosen, the last one yesterday. You have to understand that they are not administering the fund. Uh, we found that out yesterday. Uh, last week at the meeting, they were administering the fund. They are not administering the fund. Someone else, some other independent entity will actually administer the dollars, the fund. Secondly, they are administering the claims process. And that's what they will be doing. And in a sense, although they're independent, they will be representing BP in this claims process. They will be setting up the mechanism to determine claims that are filed. And they will be taking over the interim payments that BP's claims process has been doing are as what Mr. Rosen calls are emergency payments. And that's what he looks at them. And Mr. Feinberg looks at them as emergency payments. And their goal is to have this fund operational by August 1. Now, that may or may not happen because there's a lot of training and a lot of people to put in place, and there's many offices along the Gulf Coast that they're going to have to establish, and there are people they're going to have to train to handle these claims. And, and to be very honest with you, they are, uh, Mr. Feinberg especially is talking a lot about the law, and he doesn't know what the law is. I'm going to tell you that. We've had numerous conversations with Mr. Rosen during this process, and he is begging for input from the lawyers about what the law is, what each state's law is, how the OPA uh, affects it, and what is going on. So this is not a done deal. This is a work in progress, and that's what he says every time we meet with him. This is a work in progress. They are in the process of doing the, the uh, procedural rules that will be necessary, the requirements for a submission of evidence and things of that nature, how you document your claim, all of that is done. Now, we were promised yesterday by Mr. Rosen that, that all of us, all of the lawyers that are involved, will get an opportunity to look at the first draft of that and have input in it. And hopefully, that's what's going to occur because... I suspect that some of that is going to need to be tweaked quite a bit. Well, let's talk a little bit about how the process is going to work. Uh, like I say, it's a work in progress, but I've, I've been a, with him now for about four or five hours in questioning, so I, I have some understanding, I think, of where they're going and how he thinks they're going to, to go. They, they intend on working the emergency payments with very little documentation. 
Not nearly as much documentation is going to be required later. But they're trying to get money in the hands of people and businesses that need it to be able to, to pay their mortgages and operate their businesses. And that's what their goal is. Now, what they say and what is going to be the more difficult part of this process is that they intend to convert the payments two to three months after the spill is stopped to final payments. In other words, they're going to want people who have claims in front of that fund to put together a package that will tell them what their future damages are going to be. And this is going to be a complicated process. A lot of people and businesses can easily give them information about how much income they're having every month and what's going on. But when you convert to the final one, this is what you're going to be faced with. You're going to be faced with showing how long the ecological impact is going to last. You're going to be faced with showing how that affects uh, whatever your claim is. In other words, how long your claim is going to go on because of this ecological impact or because of stigma on our economy in this area, our tourism in this area, stigma on our property values in this area because people are no longer interested in moving to a place where tar balls are washing up on their beach and frequently you may have oil come on your beach. All of those things are going to have to be done. You're going to have to, to forecast the economics of that situation. So you're, you're, you might have to have an economist to show what the what the forecast is for this type of impact and other business experts who can say this business is going to be affected this way because of this ecological impact to the area, because of the way the public all around the country envisions what this area is going to be like from now on. You have all of those things that are going to be part of this process. It's not going to be an easy job to do. Now let's talk a little bit about more what they're, they're thinking in terms of and what's happening. They are thinking that they will make a final offer and people will sign a release to BP. Now this is only BP and there are many other, as you've heard, possible uh, parties to this litigation. All of the Transocean companies, uh, Halliburton's uh, Energy Services Company, uh, the uh, manufacturer of the blowout preventive device, Cameron, uh, the uh, partners of BP in this entire process and a number of subcontractors who were involved in a lot of the operations that were going on are all potential defendants in this case. And it's a myriad of law that's applicable to all of this and all of these people. First, we have to deal with the maritime admiralty laws, some of those ancient and very, very uh, contrary to the recovery of damages and circumstances like this. We have to deal with how that's going to preempt state law in all of these cases. And, I, and I'm going to talk a minute in a minute about the Florida Pollution Act because I think it's very, very important to people that are located in Florida. But all of these things are coming in. There is the question of punitive or punishment damages for BP and the other defendants. If you sign a release with BP, those damages are gone. Uh, under the Oil Pollution Act, you don't, you're not entitled to punitive damages, but under other theories of law that are available, uh, people, some of the people who have been injured will be entitled to punitive damages. How is the process going to work? You're going to make your submission to them. They're going to take it. It will be assigned to basically a hearing officer or a judge, kind of. He won't be a judge. He'll be someone trained to do it uh, in regard to that. And that person with help of probably staff, will go over that claim and they'll determine, okay, your claim is worth X amount of dollars and that offer will be made to you with a release. Now that's not final at that point. You will have a right, according to what Mr. Rosen envisions, to then have a hearing in, with that person and you can go over them. You can also submit additional evidence and there may well be a negotiation process that goes on in regard to settling the claim. If you're not satisfied with the claim at that point in time, you can appeal that decision to go forward. Now, uh, yesterday when he talked about that, that someone said, well, what, what's that appeal going to be? Well, they're going to, they're going to, they envision appointing a number of judges around the country, either retired or active judges, and they will set on three judge panels and they'll make a determination at that point in time. And they will then determine it. But the reality of the situation is, is that 
the, what they're going to get is what happened in the process. And unless you've got some significant legal argument about something they did wrong, the likelihood of that panel changing a decision is slim and none. Then what is your decision? You take the money, you sign a release, and your other options are, as you've heard before, file a lawsuit against BP and the other parties. You can always file a lawsuit against the other parties if, because they have not set up a claims process. So they, they have not done that at this point in time. But if you're going to sue them under the Oil Pollution Act, you must make a claim with them beforehand, and it's not a simple pay me, okay? The presentment requirements under the Oil Pollution Act are extensive, and they are a condition precedent to filing a lawsuit. So you can't file it until you've done it. And there is a Circuit Court of Appeals decision out of our circuit court here, out of the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals, the Federal Appeals Court, that says that. You can't do it. So we've, we've got that. And there's a significant problem with the presentment in this particular types of cases. One of the things that Mr. Um, Rosen is talking about is that BP will be agreeing in this process that if you file a claim with the, with the fund, with this being called the Gulf Recovery Fund, by the way, if you file a, a, a claim in that process, that that will satisfy the presentment requirements under the Oil Pollution Act. It will as to BP if they agree to it. It will not as to the other responsible parties uh, in this matter. So you have to be careful. It is not a simple, straightforward progress. It is complicated. It is very complicated legally. So you got all of those things there. And then we in Florida need to think very seriously about Florida's Pollution Act because that act may be, and in fact, most of the lawyers involved from Florida believe it's even broader than the Oil Pollution Act, which did away with, with certain ancient theories of tort law uh, to allow for recovery of damages in certain circumstances. Florida's Pollution Act contains language that as follows. All damages resulting from discharge or other condition of pollution. The Act itself and the Florida Supreme Court two weeks ago in the case of Curd versus Mosaic Fertilizer, a very timely decision for all of the victims in our state, uh, said that that act must be liberally construed and found that damages that the, that the lower court had found not compensable were actually compensable. And the language of that case makes it clear that if you fit within the definition of what damages are in that statute, it is strict liability against the, the people involved with making the discharge and those damages cover whatever you can prove. Now, Let's don't get silly here and think that, that every uh, podunk little business out in, in Cantonment who obviously may be affected is going to be able to recover because at some point the law will draw a line and at some point uh, the court will make a decision that the damages are too remote from the event. So it's, it's an it's a area of law that is certainly in flux at this moment. And we're not all going to know what the answers are until we get through it. And do you need a lawyer? You make that decision yourself from what I've told you about the situation. Uh, I'm not going to tell you you do. You certainly don't have to have one to file a claim with the fund. It's not required. Now, do you want to sign a release before talking to a lawyer? Uh, I urge you that that would not be a very smart idea. What documentation are you going to need in order to fi file your claim and to hopefully improve the odds of your claim being paid? We're going to talk about tracking your damages and what you need to do. Matthew Vilmer. Thank you, Sue. Uh, my name is Matthew Vilmer, and I practice with the law firm of Emanuel Shepard and Condon. Um, we represent a lot of clients that are currently filing claims with the BP interim claims process, which eventually will be taken over by this $20 billion fund. Um, and currently, the way we explain it to our clients and the way I'd, I'd like to posit it to you all today are there are four different categories of documents that you need to keep track of when you make a claim with BP's interim fund right now, and I would say this $20 billion fund in the future. Um, and, and we refer to these documents in the categories of lost profit documents, extra expenses documents, 
diminished value of your business or personal property documents, and then just a final catch-all category of, of some additional documents that I'm going to talk to you all about today. Um, so first, in regards to the lost profit documents, you need to keep track of your tax returns for the previous five years. Uh, BP suggests the previous three years. Uh, we suggest to our clients five years because what you really need to do is, is keep in mind that we're going to, um, or, or experts, economists, will look at your business and see exactly what your profits were all the way through 2008, 2009. And as 2010 approached, what exactly your profits were going to be throughout 2010. And we understand that there was an uptick in Pensacola and the, and the Gulf Coast business in 2010. Um, but then the oil spill happened and everybody's profits went down. So we need to forecast that and say exactly what your lost profits would have been into the future. And tax returns are exactly what you need for that. Um, second, financial statements. That would be profit and loss statements for the previous five years. Uh, BP currently requires you to give them profit and loss statements on a monthly basis and in some cases a biweekly basis uh, to prove your losses for these emergency payments that Jim was speaking about. Um, next would be cancellations. And cancellations are extremely important if you are someone who rents your property out to individuals. Um, cancellations, not only how many cancellations you've had now since the oil spill, how many cancellations you had before the oil spill um, to, to get a historical perspective. But the most important would be the reason for those cancellations because we have to draw some kind of correlation between the fact that the people who canceled to go rent your home that's on the beach um, did that because of the oil spill. And that's what BP and, and others are going to require to really substantiate your damages to say, okay, these people, in fact, did not show up and canceled their reservation because of the oil spill. And it's difficult to get those individuals to really put that in writing, but you need to try to do that. So whether that be email or letter or something, um, that documentation is absolutely necessary uh, to substantiate your claim. Um, next under lost profits would be um, for fishermen, uh, shrimpmen, oystermen, you need to keep track of your trip tickets. These trip tickets will substantiate your lost revenues so you can file a claim with BP. Uh, that's the first category of documents, lost profits. Uh, the second category of documents would be extra expenses. So that would be any money that you spent to fight the negative effects of the oil spill. Um, let's say safety preparations that you took to protect your property. Uh, someone down, down the road from me put a bunch of hay bales out on their beach to protect the property from the oil. Um, also, anything that you spent cleaning up the oil, and, and I know that, that a lot of the, the local counties and, and the city are doing the cleanup effort, but anything that you spent yourself uh, to clean up the oil. Uh, next would be any increase in advertising that you've done if you're a business owner to try to fight the negative effects of the oil spill. So um, I, I know right down the road uh, from us there's a wave runner place that rents out wave runners and they have a tar ball discount right now for people who want to come and wave run out in, the, uh, out in the ocean. And any discounts or advertising that you offer, keep track of those because you can include those in your claim and recover for that. Um, next, uh, and, and really the way I explain this to people is, but for the oil spill, I wouldn't have spent this money. So anything you spend but for the oil spill, keep track of that money because you can recover for that. Um, finally, it would be information regarding changes in employment status. If you own a business and you had to fire employees, lay employees off, or reduce salaries because of the oil spill, keep track of that as well. So that would be lost profits, extra expenses. The third category would be diminished value of your business or of your property. And regarding businesses, all the information that I just discussed will really substantiate a claim for loss of value of your business. But loss of value of your property is, is important. If you have any previous appraisals that were done of your property before the oil spill, make sure you keep track of those because those will be absolutely necessary um, if you have them. Uh, to really provide a before and after picture. Um, a lot of law firms will hire uh, appraisal experts that will come in and do an appraisal after the oil spill and say, look, here was the value before and here was the value after. You owe me the difference, BP, or any responsible party. Um, finally, we have a catch-all category with just a couple of other items that you all need to know about. Uh, the first would be anything that you did to mitigate your damages due to the oil spill. And mitigation of damages is, is kind of a, a legal term, but you have a duty to mitigate your damages against the oil harming your property or your business. So for example, uh, we represent someone um, who had their, their boat in the water and the oil was headed towards his boat and he knew that. 
Um, so instead of just leaving his boat in the water to get harmed by the oil, he has a duty to mitigate his damages. So he pulled his boat up out of the water, shipped it across the country, drove it in a trailer, stayed in a hotel to dry dock it in Alabama. We filed a claim with BP, and he recovered for all of his damages, which would be the cost of dry docking it in Alabama, the cost of driving across the country, and the cost of staying in a hotel. So you have the duty to mitigate your damages, and any costs that you incur mitigating your damages, make sure you keep track of that. Um, next would be a narrative, uh, a narrative of your plans, your strategies, uh, what you expected the year of 2010 to look like before the oil spill came around. Uh, that's important as well. Uh, and finally, any pictures or photographic evidence uh, or video that you have of the beaches before, during, or after the oil spill. Um, and, and just on, a, on another topic, I know that we discussed um, the SBA loans and the bridge loans, but I think it would be good for everybody to know just a little bit of detail about those loans. Um, the SBA short-term loans are up to $2 million. Um, there's a 30-year repayment plan, and it's a 4% interest for for-profit businesses. There's a 3% interest on not-for-profit businesses. Um, additionally, there's these bridge loans that are being offered, which are anywhere between $1,000 and $25,000. You have up to a year to repay that loan, and it's at zero interest, and you don't have to make a single payment <coughs> until the loan is over, until the end of the year. Um, so with that being said, thank you very much for, uh, for having me here, and, and we really appreciate it. And certainly we thank all of our attorneys. We have uh, certainly gotten a wealth of information from you. At this point, we do want to open it up to any questions from members of our studio audience. If you would step to the microphone and pose your question. Our panelists, they stand ready to, to answer. And as we have people getting ready to come, I would like to pose this question to, to any of you on the, on the panel who might be able to answer. It, it seems like there is a lot that an individual has to do. Um, how do you know, for example, filing the claim with BP, and then we have the liability trust fund. At what point do you file the liability trust fund claim? Can that be done simultaneously? It, it sounds like this could be a very lengthy process, potentially. As Jason mentioned, it's a 90 day period that you have to wait after you submit the claim before you can seek recovery under either the uh, file the lawsuit under the Federal Oil Pollution Act or seek recovery from the trust fund. So there is that submission of the claim uh, and then the 90 day waiting period. And the, and Mr. Strong, the problem with that is claim is defined in the OPA, and claim requires a sum certain. And as Mr. McKenzie has alluded to, nobody knows what the extent of their loss is at this point. So the 90-day window may not, probably not, begin to run until the some certain claim is filed. And you, I, I, we know of individuals who have been told, you can file a claim. Uh, we will pay X amount of dollars should we you know, approve this claim. And then if you have more losses, come back so you can keep going to the well. And, and usually that works every single month, at least what we've noticed right now, is BP <laughs> will give you a new payment every month to re-up whatever your damages are um, if you provide them with additional documentation to prove those damages after that month. The, the problem with the whole process is that uh, the, in, a, in our outline there is a, uh, an analysis made by my partner, De Jack De La Piedra, of the, of the Coast Guard regulations and how they interact. Basically, the Coast Guard regulations are the only real guideline we have as to what is required in a claim and what the process is. And there are some significant problems with getting the 90 days to run based upon the Coast Guard regulations because the Coast Guard says, if, for instance, if you present a claim to the responsible party and they partially pay your claim, you are required to file an amended claim. Now, technically speaking, uh, BP could sit there and dole you out $10 a month and, and keep you from ever being able to perfect a claim. So it, there are some sign significant problems. Um, uh, I know that there are organizations, the American Association of Justice, which is the National Trial Lawyers Organization, is intervening with the president now. Uh, asking him to ask the Coast Guard to revise those regulations. You have to understand these regulations and these rules came about based upon the Exxon Valdez spill, which is a very different animal than what we have. That was a one-time spill. We knew exactly what was there. They knew what was going to happen. We don't know. We have a gusher going 
today, and we don't know if they're ever going to be able to stop it. Yes, sir. Good morning. Um, my son is working for a staffing company, and they're refusing to pay him. Um, can you tell me where I would go to pursue getting him help? To the uh, federal wage and hour people. Federal wage and hour people? Yes. Is he, is he working for one of the BP contractors and they're refusing to pay him? or The what's staffing company for the co contractor. Okay, yeah. I I would, first, I would contact BP's 800 number and talk to them. But then if you don't get any results, I would go to the federal wage and hour office because that's their job is to get those people paid. Thank you, sir. And this seems to be something that is adding insult to injury for so many people. We're beginning to hear of blatant scams uh, where people are having to pay for the, uh, the hazardous materials uh, training, which is supposed to be free, uh, just one thing and another. What, how do we help those individuals uh, recover their, their losses and, and what's happening to them? Um, actually, I would, if I were those kind of people and I got caught in that, if, if the state attorney's office and the police can't help you, in regard to what's there. I would file a claim with BP. It is a damage that's associated with the oil spill. And to be, believe it or not, they're, they're paying a lot of that stuff that we can't believe they're paying and they're fighting people who have legitimate claims. It's crazy. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Charles Baer, and thank you all for being here today. This is a, an issue I think that will be with us for some time to come. And every day I hear from people who are are confused about the process and thank you for sharing a lot about how people should go through the process and what the claims process is. I have a specific question. I was approached by a real estate agent who had someone they'd been working with for about six months uh, to purchase a home down here in Pensacola and eventually the deal fell through because of the oil spill. Um, and they were asking what the requirements were to be able to submit a claim for that. And from what I understand, they need to get something in writing from the prospective buyer, is that correct? Is that the best way they should go about that? Absolutely, that's definitely uh, what they need to do. Um, we, we represent a couple different real estate agencies and the way we see it, there's two different types of claims. Um, the first type of claim would be in this emergency claim process where any contracts that you actually had that were canceled uh, during, during the due diligence period because of the oil spill. If you can get anything in writing from them, which is somewhat difficult if there was a contract, but uh, if you can get anything in writing from them that says, I canceled because of the oil spill, that will substantiate your claim. Uh, the second type of claim would be a overall loss of business claim. So, uh, you know, canceled prospects, people who were thinking about buying but decided not to. Canceled listing agreements where they listed their property with your real estate agency but then canceled that. All of that would kind of funnel into an overall loss of business claim for the future. So, uh, yeah, they can file those two different types of claims, definitely. Okay, right, because I can see it from the perspective they've lost the potential for uh, the commission and then they've also lost what they put into it. And, you know, mm -hmm. if those people came in from out of town, there were some expenses related to that. So that would fall into that last category uh, that you're talking about? Absolutely. Okay. And if there was a, a canceled contract, that commission amount that they lost would be a part of that canceled contract claim. Great. Sure. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Uh, my name is Chet Sue. I've lived in the Deep South along the Gulf for most of my life, beginning with Mississippi Delta, and I just retired from UWF. I represent a citizens group called Save Our Sands. And our question for our group, which is growing every day, and we represent all ages of people, all politics, and all groups, is that we're interested in trying to hold the governments from the feds all the way down to local areas, and especially those states like Louisiana, Texas, who have been very quiet lately, and uh, Alabama and Mississippi for the stuff they've sending over to us, as well as the feds for their negligence. So we're interested in a little thing called class action for, on behalf of we the people. What do you guys think? Class actions are, are not as uh, easy to establish and to prosecute as the public seems to think. Um, you, you have, a, a, as the plaintiff, if you are proposing a class action, you have a rather uh, substantial burden to meet before you can even get the class certified as a class. With that said, there are distinct problems with class actions in relation to this particular tragedy. And those basically revolve around uh, two things. Number one, 
Under maritime law, uh, there is a, a rule called the economic loss rule that prohibits people from recovering damage to anything unless they actually have direct damage to property which they own, okay? That's number one problem. The OPA took away that problem as far as claims were concerned for oil pollution or oil discharge. The problem with that is OPA requires a presentment of the claim. So what you then have to deal with is the fact that you can't present the claim because you can't present the claim of the unnamed members of the class. So it causes a rather significant problem if you're going to proceed under the OPA. The, the Florida Pollution Act has no such requirement. And we all believe that you could establish a cause of action and a class action under the Florida Pollution Act. The problem we have right now is a lot of the damages that we're talking about, such as uh, Mr. Sue was talking about, which are more uh, esoteric in regard to the causation, the direct causation from it. Uh, we're not certain that that's going to be covered under the Florida Pollution Act. And certain damages, we're not certain whether the Florida Pollution Act is going to be allowed to be even used by the court because of preemption by maritime law. Uh, there are lots of questions to be answered there. Certainly, Mr. Sue, we are looking at the possibility of class actions in regard to certain of these claims. For instance, and there's a significant problem here, subsistence. It's a word that's used in the OPA. And basically what that means is you, you use a natural resource uh, for something that you don't necessarily sell or make a profit on. We have a lot of people from all over the Gulf Coast who fish, okay? And they don't fish because it's fun, although they enjoy it. They fish to feed their families. Uh, I've talked to a number of people who are in that circumstance, and, and they're looking at a possibility of not being able to put food on their table, and that's subsistence. Well, those claims are, are very difficult to put into dollar amounts, and they're, they're not going to be tremendous amounts. Though the only possible remedy really for those people is a class action lawsuit. And right now we have substantial impediments to doing that. So yes, there are lots of things that are available. There are all the fishing organizations who are looking at possible claims, not necessarily that, that they need to, to get back, but, but, but they want to establish ways to try to, to bring the Gulf and the fishery back after this is over with. And although BP is responsible for doing that, that's the state's claim, not theirs. And so that's where the problems lie in regard to this. It's not simple. It's an exceptionally complicated situation with the various parts of laws of states and the federal government and the old common law concerning maritime and admiralty law that are all intersecting to cause a significant legal question about what can and cannot be done. Yes, ma'am. My first question is in regards to the Gulf Recovery Fund. Um, currently, ESIS is managing it for BP with Worley acting as the claims people here. Uh, will they still be in charge of the actual adjusters? Will they be the adjusters or will the federal government bring other people in to administer the claims? It's not the federal government, it's Feinberg and Rosen, okay? Feinberg and Rosen have been appointed to administer the claims process. Mm -hmm. Now, we had those very same questions for Steve Rosen, for Mike Rosen yesterday. And his answer to the question is, is that we may or may not use some of the same people who are in the claims process. We will make that determination as we go. But what he has also said, and I think everyone who's, who, or at least some of the people who have been dealing with ESIS will, will be happy to hear, is that they said, whoever gets there will be trained on what we want them to do, not what they were doing, okay? And that will be very different, and they intend to train them and, and give them distinct guidelines that they're to follow. The problem right now is, is that BP didn't have a claims process at all until two months ago, and, and they had to put one together in a big hurry because they're required to under the OPA. They didn't do this out of the goodness of their heart, folks. Don't worry about it. Federal law required them to do it. So... Uh, 
we don't know all the answers, and he doesn't know all the answers, and he couldn't tell us which and what, but, but I suspect that some of the same claims people will still be involved, but hopefully there's going to be different people supervising them. Okay, and my second question is um, the impact on development and new construction out on the water, out um, on waterfront property, on the beach. Um, I know that there was a development that was supposed to be going up that I believe has been canceled. So how would um, a development organization document <coughs> that loss or put together a claim as contractors, as developers, a claim against BP because people don't want to build on really ugly land? Well, um, you know, that's kind of difficult because do the subcontractors file a claim? Do the contractor file a claim? Um, who files the claim? Um, what we've been doing right now, at least with real estate agencies, and I think this might be applicable, is that it's easier if one overarching organization files the claim. So uh, in, in the case of real estate, that would be the real estate agency instead of each individual agent. Because let's say the subcontractor goes out and files a claim. Um, or the myriad of subcontractors. Well, they may claim certain damages, overstate, understate their damages, and then the developer goes out and files a claim and comes up with a different amount of damages. Um, so if you can kind of, if the subcontractors and the contractor can work with the developer to file one overarching claim that would make each one of those members of the project whole, I think that would be beneficial to do it that way. Um, instead of filing all of these tiny other claims that could be inconsistent and kind of shoot yourself in the foot for, for future claims. Um, that's what I would recommend. I have a little bit of different idea in that regard because I, I know sort of where they're going and what they're going to look at in those circumstances. Prove me prove to me what your profits were going to be off of this. Uh, I think it'd be very difficult to combine what a subcontractor's profits were likely to be off a job and a contractor's profits off the job. So I, I think you're really going to have to split it up and they're going to have to come with their individual claims in regard to it, even though you may end up with some conflicts. We've heard about diminished property value and you know, hopefully having um, an appraisal ahead of time, which I would imagine a lot of people didn't, not knowing that this was going to, to necessarily happen. Would you have to be in the process of selling your home to file a claim for any diminished property value? Or is that one of those things that might fall into a class action suit because one might assume that everyone is going to experience some diminished property value because of this? We actually have filed a class action lawsuit on behalf of property owners in certain areas that, that we've delineated as our proposed class, which are basically areas that are close to the water or beach type areas. Um, uh, it's, a, it's an interesting question. Uh, we believe that first there are Florida cases that allow for diminution of property values associated with pollution type of claims. Uh, they're, they're usually been based on nuisance. We believe that Florida's Pollution Act will cover that situation. And we also believe that the language of the OPA probably covers the situation where, because basically what the Florida Act and the OPA did is say, if you can show legal costs, in other words, and that's as uh, Mr. Vilmer was talking about earlier, is, is but for the damage. Um, if you can show legal cause and you can show foreseeability of these types of damages, not the specific damage that happened, but these types of damages associated with your conduct, then you're within the foreseeable zone of risk of that type of conduct, and then therefore you have a claim for this. Now, how far is that going to go back from the water? I think that's the issue that the court is going to deal with, really, when this all shakes out, is how far it goes back from the water. So yes, we believe that's a claim. Now secondly, do, did you have to be in the process of selling your property? Florida law has recognized that you can recover diminution in value uh, the minute that the diminution in value occurs. You don't have to wait and sell your property to do so. And uh, I, I think that that's going to be a very, very significant part of the claims for people in the areas that beaches have actually been oiled. And to tag along with that, um, I discussed earlier that if you had any, any copies of your appraisals that were done before the oil spill, keep those. Um, but if you don't, that doesn't tank your claim. Uh, what you really need to do, if, if you hire an expert appraiser, he can do an appraisal as of the day before the oil spill. 
and say, here's what your property value was the day before the oil spill, and here's what it is today. So it doesn't kill your claim if you do not have an appraisal, but it would be helpful. There's, there's sources of value out there. You, you know, the county appraisal sites, comparable sales based on different dates. And uh, I have to laud Chris Jones and Greg Brown because they're petitioning to have the date of appraisal changed to right before the spill and after the spill so that so that property values are based on after the spill and take into account the effect. So we would see a, a reduction in our tax bill. Those losses that the county has suffered would then be a claim by the counties against BP. The, the question that, that Jim alluded to earlier is going to be, if I own property north of I-10, do I have a diminution in value claim? Or if I'm over in Cordova Park, do I have a diminution of value claim? Uh, the law uh, was and may have changed a little bit, but was that uh, your, your property had to be impacted by the pollution. Uh, so that's where the battleground is going to be. Waterfront property, oil, oil beaches, likely. Uh, as you move away, more difficult, I think. But, but, we're, but lawyers are going to argue about that. We are, and there are lots of experts out there. For, we are talking presently with, um, with a gentleman who is both a, a appraiser and a Ph.D. economist, and his organization, his company, for the past 25 years has studied the effect of catastrophes and pollution incidents and all of these things on the values of properties in those particular areas. The expertise is out there. They're not the only one. There are others that do this. And so there's a lot of, of data available to establish the, the fact that this type of event causes diminution of property values in the areas where the, the pollution occurs. When you talk about a class action lawsuit, does an individual have to sign on? How do they know that they have been included in a class action? Um, it, it, I think in a situation like this, uh, the, the, the rules of civil procedure require in certain class actions, and this would be one of them, that notice would have to be given to all potential members of the class and, and the, the court and the class counsel uh, craft and figure out the best way to do that, and the court orders that to be followed. And then some, I'm sure some people have seen in the paper sometimes notices about class actions or have, in fact, received direct mail solicitation about you are potentially a class member. And that, that will set forth the procedure by which one remains a class member and how they contact the, the class council or not. Have ever gotten one of those in the mail? And, and typically if you, you have a 401k or anything, and I, I see that you're laughing already because... It, you, you, you look at the front page uh, of, the, of the 15 to 20 pages and you go, I don't know what this is, but whatever it is, it goes in the garbage. Right. And I would urge you not to do that. Uh, in I, this would, sense, <laughs> I would agree. Go see a lawyer right. if you get it. Or call class counsel. Right. I mean, uh, class counsel usually, if, if you don't get to talk to them, you're going to get to talk to someone in their office who is very knowledgeable about the process and can give you information about what is going on. Uh, what happens, and it's an interesting question, so you ask, do you have to sign on? No, you have to sign off, okay? If you are a member of the class, if you don't want to participate in the class process, you have to opt yourself out of the class. And believe me, there, if, if there are classes that are certified, there will be a lot of people who will opt themselves out. There are a lot of lawyers who will opt all of their clients out of the class. It, it, it varies about what goes on. A lot of, a lot of people are, have been involved with, with what you're talking about, the ones where the, the, uh, the uh, stocks have been manipulated or something of that nature, and you, you sit down and figure it out, and you're going to be entitled to $113, okay? The lawyers make millions, and that's all we ever hear. The lawyers make millions, and everybody else gets $113. Uh, Believe me, if you get in one of these classes, it's not going to be that, okay? It will not be that. There is no way a court, especially an MDL court, who would probably be the one who's going to be doing the approval, is going to allow a settlement of any of these claims, unless they are small claims, for a little bit of money. It's not going to happen. The court controls it. And so you need to stay abreast of what is going on there. Uh, and like I say, even our class, it's going to be difficult for us to get it certified. I mean, it's going to be very difficult.
While we're on the, the, the topic of, of lawyers making millions, and, and all of you gentlemen have been so gracious to, to volunteer your time to be here, and you've not plugged your, your individual firms, but for, for individuals who feel like they need a lawyer to represent them, uh, and especially if you were someone who happened to have been a waitress, or serving in the hospitality industry on, on one of our beaches and, and making minimum wage, you, you feel like you can't access an attorney. How, how does that process work for us little people? There are, there are almost uniformly all of the lawyers who are doing the claims process with people like that. Not necessarily complex business transactions, but with people like that are assisting them with no fees, okay? That's being done all across the coast not just here, <clears throat> not just in Pensacola, but all the way to Louisiana. Lawyers are assisting people with small claims every day. And believe me, it's a pain in the rear for the law firms. So, how, you know. how do you find those, those, those attorneys who are doing that? I mean, is there a separate listing? Is there a number that people can, can call? Is there, no, how, how do you know? It, it's just the firms involved that are doing okay. that. And call around and, and talk to the firms and see yeah. what they charge. Um, but uh, but uh, absolutely, on a whole, most firms are doing smaller claims for free. Some other questions that have been posed uh, from our audience. Will health issues that result from oil spills be covered by the claims process? And how will illnesses be diagnosed to make sure that they are, in, in essence, oil spill related? And if you have health issues, what, what should someone do? We asked that specific question of Mr. Rosen yesterday in regard to the fund. And he assured everyone that they are intending to cover those types of claims in this fund. Now, the diagnosis, that's a, that's a different animal, and that's gonna have to be worked out. The, the people who are doing the cleanup, for instance, are the ones that are most susceptible to this. Uh, we, we, we know from, from other cleanups that have done that the people who are actually involved many times have suffered long-term long and long-standing health problems after it's over with. But there are also people who are very sensitive. I've, I've got an allergy problem, as you can tell today. It's flared up on me today. And, uh, but I'm not, I'm not a severe allergy, but people who do have severe allergies and people with, with um, you know, breathing difficulties of any kind may well be affected because uh, we're going to get a lot of, of um, wafting air here that will bring in. And, and let me also tell you, that the, the, the real problem in this and the one that has not been discussed in great detail because they don't know a lot about it is the dispersants that they've been putting on this oil. Those dispersants, contrary to what the Admiral from the Coast Guard said last week when he was interviewed by our paper, those dispersants do not make the oil less toxic. The studies have shown that the oil is six times more toxic after the, after the dispersant is put in it. Secondly, at a, at a conference last week, we listened to a scientist talk about the fact that they have now found in the, in the waters where the dispersants are put into the oil immediately, they are finding some very, very serious carcinogens that are almost impossible to remove from the environment. So are there going to be long-term health effects? There could be, and it could be a significant problem. Um, uh, contrary to all the beach businesses, and I hate to say this, but I certainly wouldn't let anyone in my family in that water right now. And, and just to tag along, I know a lot of people who touch it and want to grab it, you know, see what's going on with the oil. Don't do that at all whatsoever. Don't touch the oil. Um, and I'm sure you all have heard about benzene and, and you know, its, its composition in the oil. Don't touch it. Mr. Peterson, let me ask you uh, in reference to the claims process, um, is it better to go class action or to file on your own? Or how do you know which is in your best interest? We are recommending our clients uh, file a claim through the claims process. And the, the OPA sets up the claims process for them to, to, to make payments for the the claims as defined, in the, in, and then if you're not satisfied, you have the option of filing a suit or going uh, to the liability trust fund. Uh, but I say that with a caveat. I mean, everybody's situation is different, but what I can tell you is that the litigation process right now is, I mean, you're not going to get paid through the litigation process as we speak right now. I mean, we're waiting to the end of July just to find out where the venue 
of the litigation is going to be. So, you know, not from a lawyer perspective, but just from a business person or a person that needs money, I'm going to cast my lot with the, with the claims process. But when you, if you do get to the point of needing to get to court, go on your own or class action? Uh, that's, again, that's an individual situation. Uh, if I'm one of the largest landowners in the state of Florida, <coughs> I probably don't want to be in a class action. I'm in a league of my own. If I'm uh, somebody that uh, has a smaller claim and don't have a lot of resources, uh, maybe I participate in a class action. One of the benefits of remaining in the class is that you get all of the discovery that is conducted by the class council. Uh, and there is a tremendous amount of discovery uh, that will occur, and you get the benefit of that by staying in the class. One of the risks of opting out is you don't get the benefit of all of that information. Uh, so you, you have to weigh that for each individual client, and each client has to weigh that on their own as well. There have been questions uh, arising, especially as we have had Tropical Storm, now Hurricane Alex in the Gulf, um, homeowner insurance which is, has certainly been an issue for, for many people in just weather situations across the Gulf Coast, but now we have the oil compounding that. Uh, one question from a member of the audience, how much can be recovered from regular homeowner insurance? If it's you know waterfront property, boats, lawns, et cetera, any damage to your docks, what should you expect your insurance to pay? Well, most homeowner's insurance policies have a pollution exclusion in them. Um, so as far as oil spilling up on your shores, it, it might be difficult uh, to make a claim with your homeowner's insurance to actually get paid. Um. Uh, I, I litigated a, a ton, a ton of hurricane claims, as did some of the other people here after Hurricane Ivan. Um, there is a, a big interplay between flood insurance and wind insurance, or your regular homeowners, which may cover your wind claim. Uh, uh, there are lots of questions that are going to have to be asked and answered in regard to that. The, the pollution uh, exclusions, as been alluded to by Mr. Vilmer, th those things will all have to come into play in regard to it. Um, I suspect that in all likelihood any pollution exclusions in federal flood insurance policies are likely to be waived by the federal government if that occurs. So I, 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 that one would, would help. But the other thing that's going to happen is, and this is what the scientists are talking about now, is that if a tropical storm comes through here, all of those chemicals that are in the top of the water area are going to be evaporated into the air and dropped here by rains, okay, from the hurricanes and by winds blown by the hurricanes. That's a different animal and a totally different animal. And that's going to be probably a war with the, with the uh, wind insurance carriers if that happens. And that's probably going to cause damage far, far past direct damage that we're now getting from the pollution. It's a really, really scary proposition in regard to that happening in this area. And which brings to mind again the, the health concerns or the potential health concerns. We have already heard of people who have gone to the emergency room either because of respiratory problems or coming in physical contact with the oil. Are those expenses also covered? Any, any medical costs? Supposed to be. They're supposed to be. But are they going to be? Um, it's going to be a, a real question. Uh, early on, I think BP's claims process is probably going to cover most of that stuff just because it's easier for them to pay it than it is to fight about it. Uh, but as time goes on, uh, I think we're going to see a little different. And the, 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 the connection of, of illnesses months afterwards are going to be the difficult part because that's going to require some significant study of this community by uh, the, the experts in the field to determine whether there's a causal relationship or not. Mr. Palmer, I believe you had a... Well, I was going to... You are talking flood insurance, and the last I heard... Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I'd see some insurance brokers in the audience, flood insurance renewals and new placement are not being funded. And so I would encourage everyone to call Jeff Miller's office, call the, your, your senator's office and, and, and let people know we need to have this situation resolved as it relates to flood insurance coverage in Florida. And I would throw in the pollution exclusion issues should also be determined now before we get into this battle like we did with Ivan about wind v. flood. 
So uh, I would just encourage those that are listening to this to, to talk to their representatives because we have a, I'll call it a flood insurance crisis right now. Another question, is $20 billion enough with government taking their share first? And what is the order that businesses will be paid? And, and I'll add to that businesses and individuals. Well, the Haas Center, uh, Dick Harper is, is one of the leaders actually in the region for performing an economic analysis of the impact. And so um, uh, I tried calling his office yesterday in case that question came up, wasn't able to reach it. But I, I would say I, I'm going to have to defer to uh, people like Rick Harper who, who are making that analysis as we speak. That question uh, has been posed to BP. Um, first and foremost, when this fund was first announced, uh, and it, this was both by BP and by the president, uh, I believe that everyone who heard about it thought it was for the victims and not for the governments. Okay? Now, last week was the first we had heard that they had backed off of that position and that now uh, the, the fund was really available to BP to pay for any damages, any losses, any expenses they have in regard to the cleanup other than their transactional cost, which is like the, setting up the, the uh, operation of the claim center and funding all of that through the process. In other words, that $20 billion is there for everything, natural resource damages, the whole works. Is that $20 billion enough? Uh, they've already spent $2.65 billion in the, in the cleanup process to date. Uh, I, I think that the cleanup itself might well exceed $20 billion in, in that and government costs before this is all over with, without any doubt. What's BP going to do? BP says, has said publicly that they will continue to fund that fund even after it goes down. BP is also, uh, we have found out uh, in the last two weeks, been consulting with the top bankruptcy lawyers in the United States, okay? Uh, so you don't know what's going to happen with regard to BP. They're also facing, as you are probably aware, billions, a hundred billion dollars worth of potential liability for the loss of their stock value. That's cases against their their uh, board of directors in regard to that. But those board of directors are looking, are going to look to BP to you know, to pay for it and the involvement of their officers and that type of thing in it. We don't know whether it's enough money. We have no idea whether BP is going to go bankrupt at some point in time, and we don't know what they're going to be contributing to the fund over a long period of time. That's why it's important to not forget about the other players in regard to this. We want to take uh, just a moment, certainly, to thank our attorneys once again, Jeremy Branning with Clark Partington Hart, Larry Bond, and Stackhouse, Raymond Palmer, the law office of Raymond B. Palmer, Jason Peterson, Clark Partington Hart, Larry Bond, and Stackhouse, Jim McKenzie, McKenzie Hall and De La Pedra, and Matthew Vilmer with Emmanuel Shepard and Condon. Attorneys, again, thank you so much for coming and sharing your time. We especially thank uh, WSRE for the use of their facilities and so graciously hosting us here and for uh, the, the orchestrators of, of this incredible forum, if you would, the Pensacola Bay Area Chamber of Commerce, certainly always reaching out to meet the needs not only of businesses but of individuals in our community. And as we close, I'd like to just on a personal note take a moment that as we work through the financial end of things and as we try to restore the, the environment, we need to remind ourselves that this is a long, long-term process. Unfortunately, there will not be a fix overnight. And I think if we can mentally get our, our minds around that. But we here on the Gulf Coast have weathered many, many storms. We have done that by being supportive of each other. Please remember your neighbors and friends, especially those who are working in these businesses where they may have lost their incomes. Let's reach out and help them. Thank you.